If you enjoyed the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. Uh, we're going to talk about the coolest and most beautiful jets ever made and uh, been in service, the Tony Wack 3. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you actually managed to get an exchange tour with the RAF. Can you tell us how this came about and what the process was like to get to that point? Sure. Well, you know, you, you get to, uh, um, after you're done with your, your ground, or your, uh, I should say ground, your, your first um, squadron, and I had two of them because my first squadron went away, BF-33 went away, and then went to BF-102, the Diamondbacks. Then you have an option to go and do a, um, a, a, a tour somewhere else. You know, most of the guys go to the RAG and, and teach there. That's the, you know, the standard. You know, a lot of guys were getting sent down to apply, you know, T2s and A4s, instructing down there as well. You know, someone went to the RAG and, and taught on the Tomcat. Um, I want to do something different. I wanted a little, you know, I mean, you go, yeah. I mean, seriously. So I wanted to do an exchange tour. And I had a few different options. Um, I had some within the U.S. that could go and fly uh, Big Mouth F-16s with the Hill Air Force Base. But that's the Air Force, you know. And whilst I think I'd look good in a dress, I thought maybe I'd skip it. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. In the Air Force Base. Uh oh That's amazing. Anyway, you know. But I would look good in a dress. Anyway, let's leave that there. Um, you know, I, I think it's optional for them. Anyway, um, no, in this day and age, just joking. Um, the... Uh, um, or I could go, I had a chance to fly F-4s with the Luftwaffe in Germany, which I was really tempted oh. to do. But I didn't want my wife to have to go through language school. And I thought that would be kind of a challenge, you know, and really not fair to them. They're like, really? <laughs> Three years over there, you know, with another language. Or I could go fly Sea Harriers with the, the uh, uh, Royal Navy or Tornadoes with the Royal Air Force. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, looked it over a lot. And I, with the language, I actually cho cho chose England. I mean, I said... We like the Brits. I mean, they're great people, you know, fun. At least what we've seen in the movies, you know. And uh, um, I said, you know, let me take the Tornado. Tornado was a you know, good-looking jet, um, frontline fighter. And, you know, I'd read Tornado Down, you know, the story of those guys, you know, got shot down in, you know, the Gulf War. And I said, yeah, I'm going to try it. I think that would be fun, something very different, you know, see some different cultures and, you know, really learn about it. Yeah, and so, almost kind of the logical. You sent uh, the you said the Sea Harrier there. Is, is that the uh, you would think that's a logical cell uh, like uh, choice, obviously with the Royal Navy. But uh, yeah, you went to the F three with the REF. Good choice and the right choice. <laughs> oh, I think so too. I, I tell you what, I've had enough boat time for a little while, and I go. Uh, I think uh, I think I'll stay on the land. So yeah, I think it's a good call. So you said it was a good looking jet though, but did you know anything about the aircraft before, you know, you even got selected for it or, you know, you were going to come over? Not a heck of a lot. I didn't. I really didn't. I mean, you know, seeing pictures of it, I go, you know, it's a good looking jet. I'll tell you, you know, one thing I've, I've found is if you look at aircraft, generally the more pleasing, aesthetically, you know, aerodynamically looking jets, the better the jets are. I mean, really, you know, you take a look at it like an F-16 compared to, you know, uh, an A-10 and you go... Well, it's going to perform a lot better. Now, you may have a big gun in the A-10, but, you know, the F-16 is a very well-performing jet. Just like the Eurofighter, you look at it, it's a pretty jet. You know, the Tornado is a good-looking jet. And it usually says something about the aircraft itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you read some of the Soviet things that don't fly well, and you're like, and they look like it. You know, yeah. it's uh, you know, kind of the nature of it. It's, uh, you know, I think it's kind of like we build them you know, after nature. You look at the birds that fly fast, whether it be a swallow or, you know, a hawk or something compared to, you know, an albatross, and you go, okay. You know, it's... Uh, we kind of mimic nature, I think, in our aircraft design mm -hmm. a little bit. And so I looked at the tornado and I saw that. It's, uh, like I said, it's a good-looking jet. Yeah, it's like a, uh, we consider a, a Tomcat light, almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's some truth to that. There is. Yeah. So a sling wing, double engine, Rio in the back. It, it is. Yeah. yeah. It's like a MacBook Pro and a MacBook Air kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> My analogy right there, Steamer. But yeah. yeah, can you talk? So obviously, let's just go into the nitty gritty here. So the process, you know, coming from the squadron, you apply for this. 
Did you have to speak to a lot of RAF guys? Did you get a choice of what squadron you wanted to go to, anything like that? The job was to go to be an instructor at the at the RAG, you know, in 56 Squadron. And, of course, we, we supplemented a little bit to the Fighter Weapons School over there as well. You know, we'd, we'd fly with them as well. Um, but almost all was with, you know, 56 Squadron as an instructor there. Mm-hmm. And that's what the, you know, it was, you weren't going to a fleet squadron. You were, you were going as an instructor over there. And that was that was the job that I applied for. Did some, uh, like, exchange guys get to go into a frontline squadron? Or was it all oh, ex- yes. Uh, oh, did they? Oh, yeah, right. most, almost all do. This was kind of a, this was to the good deal. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, versus going to a squadron. Yeah, and even while I was over there, I had opportunities if I wanted to go down and fly in some, uh, um, um, with with squadrons in different places. But, yeah. you know, it was my job there as an instructor, and I had my family there and stuff, and that's what I chose to do. Yeah. So, and I, I'd seen plenty of operational, you know, action with the Tomcats. So I was, yeah. You were happy with you a lot there. I was happy to enjoy some, uh, uh, you know, British pub time and have some fun over there. Yeah, exactly. Good call. So, yeah, what was it yeah. like uh, for you arriving in the UK with your family for the first time? How did you feel about it? Well, it was exciting, but it was, you know, it was very different, very different culture. Um, you know, you really don't realize how different we are. I mean, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, maybe a very different culture separated by a common language, I guess, you know, you might yes. say it, uh, um, very different, but it was fun. I mean, it was, it was a great learning experience. I mean, you know, you, you really became, uh, came to a point where you appreciate, you know, the little things too, that you miss, just like, you know, that you have certain foods that you grew up with and you go, they're no longer there. You know, it's, it's a different, very different culture, you know, um, I remember when I got over there, I was uh, talking to a Brit, and he goes, uh, you know, Tom, you know the difference between America and England, don't you? And I was thinking, oh, okay, he's going to you know, take a piss out of me on this one. And he goes, <laughs> well, in America, you guys think 200 years is a long time. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, and in England, we think uh, 200 miles is a long distance. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fair. It's you know, really different. You know, the, um, but we, we loved it. We, had, we made great friends over there. Um, we really enjoyed a lot of things. It was it was a great experience. I uh, you know I don't regret it for a moment. It was one of the the best experiences of our fl- my flying career. So yeah, I can imagine. So when you arrived, did you go straight to Coningsby or did you have to go up to Valley? Because obviously, I'm guessing you were on the Hawk at the time. Yeah, well, we checked in in, in Coningsby and then we drove to to Valley exactly and started. Um, and we started flying really quickly because it wasn't like I was in a regular course with students. So we went in, they kind of gave you a little stuff about the the jet. They go, basically, study this, know this. You know, uh, two days from now, we'll start flying. And that's kind of how it went. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was was intensively quick. I mean, we were flying two and three times a day. Um, But, uh, um, you know, just had to get the, the, probably the hardest part wasn't flying the jet. The Hawk was a very simple jet to fly, you know, Mm -hmm. very easy. But was uh, getting the calm down because... The communications that you, that the British use is kind of opposite the American, kind of like driving on the other side of the road. They, <laughs> yeah. You know, you go if you're moving a a a, a, a squat, you know, a, a section. It's a two plane. Um, you go it'd be 90 left, 90 left go instead of left 90 left 90 go, and you're kind of like, whoa, <laughs> just just a little off. You're like, and if you did it wrong, they'd be like, yeah, damn American, you know, the Yank, he's not saying it correctly. Let's not do it. And you're like, oh boy. So, you know, but it was a lot of fun and we, we really enjoyed the time. I tell you, Wales is a beautiful area, a really neat culture up there. I mean, with the Welsh, which you didn't even know, I didn't even know existed. I mean, you know, they're, it's a very different group. So it was fun. So how long you know, did you actually of, live up there and train on the Hawk before you got posted to uh, Coningsby on the F3? We were there for about five months, hmm. you know, four to five months right in there before we were done with that training and then went down to the the uh the tornado yeah nice one and uh, obviously you said the hawk was nice there uh but how did it compare to you know the american u.s navy um uh training aircraft you went through well kind of funny because you know we got the goshawk which is the hawk transition to the you know they're they're flying that now which i didn't fly um well it was it was kind of you know kind of funny because it was kind of like a cross between a t2 and an a4 and the a4 is a little more performance oriented than that a little faster you know but it was a you know a tactical jet they used in in uh vietnam um the t2 is a little less than it but similar so it was, i mean it was kind of like a mix between the two it was a good little jet 
you know, it, you could you could pull, you know, seven and a half, eight G's for about 20 minutes in there if you could handle it. I mean, after, you know, just continual, continual, you know, you find that you're resting your head on the, uh, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, canopy over there yeah, after a while. So, but yeah, it was a fun little jet to fly. Simple, you know, and, and of course, over there in Wales, there was a lot of, you know, free flying. The neat thing about England is you could kind of go low level anywhere. Yeah. You just pop down and you're free to go, you know. So it was it was a lot of fun. So then, obviously, you went to Coningsby uh, to 56 Squadron. So can you talk us through, yeah, your ground training on the F3 and some of the similarities and differences coming from the U.S. Na Navy training system and maybe the Tomcat as well? Well, the one thing I, I found there was, um, you know, it, they had me on a full course. You know, I went through it with a, a group of students, and then I had to go through an instructor workup syllabus. So it was going to be a long period of time, you know, eight to uh, probably eight months of training before I was out on the line. Um, so we started off in the simulators, and there were a lot more, lot more simulator work with the uh, Royal Air Force than, than in the Navy. We, uh, we didn't do much simulators, you know, in the Tomcat. There just wasn't. You know, we had our, our domes where we dogfight in and stuff, um, but almost all everything was done in the jet. You know, we do a, very little simulator work in the Navy. We did a lot more in the Royal Air Force. Um, the... Uh, you know, I thought it was a good training. We had some, you know, some uh, uh, very senior guys that had uh, um, that were, you know, training us on the tournament. Matter of fact, one had pulled, pulled the bulkhead, and I was like, wow. I think that was from like James Bond, you know. <laughs> and uh, he was telling me the first time he saw a banana, you know, and I'm like, wow, you know, it was just really interesting on that. Some really some real characters over there. Um, but uh, started up, did some similar training. Then we did, you know, very similar training compared to the Tomcat. I mean, you do your basically fam flights. Formation flights, you know, you get into weapons, ACM, um, you know, pretty standard on that. I mean, not a, a heck of a lot of difference there. The uh, nice part was, you know, I was going through it and the instructor or the skipper pulled me aside one day and he said, hey, steamer, let's ready to go get a, you know, get one at the pub tonight. And I go, well, sure. So we went out after that, him and the XO, and they said, hey, we're, uh, if you're comfortable with this, we're just going to take you off this syllabus and put you on as an instructor. He, they said, you know, it's obvious this isn't quite what you needed. It, they were great, really great guys. Um, really enjoyed that. We had a lot of fun with the squadron, a lot. Yeah, so before we get into the nitty gritty of your time on the F3, did you feel welcome at the squadron there from day one? Oh yeah, yeah, the Brits were very welcome. Of course, you know, one thing my skipper did say to me, because he had been exchange officer with the French, mm. and he said, uh, so steamer, you know, uh, question. You know, he asked me that same question, you feel comfortable? And I go, yeah, and he goes, so, uh, you know, as far as I know, and he goes, it's hard to read, though, isn't it? And I go, yeah, you never really know, do you? And he goes, no, <laughs> you never really know if the, the brain when he says, good day, mate, if he's saying, hey, welcome aboard, we'd love to have you, or hey, Yank, yeah, get home. And he goes, you never really know, you know? But uh, I, we made such great friends there. We had a great time, yeah. 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 I think they were saying, you're welcome here. And that's what I'm going with, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So let's talk about your first... Um flight in the f3 and what was uh, how did you find the power I'm, I'm guessing it was completely different from the b but similar to the a yeah i mean it was it was very similar to the a i mean you know it was a little underpowered it was um what i loved about the uh, tornado those it had a really nice hud its hud was better than the f14a hud mm. um the f14 had a great air to air hud you know i mean really good for dog fighting but the engineers that designed it had put the uh, ILS, the needles, you know, as you're flying it, up high on your HUD. So coming where the carrier, you had to look up. So it made it really unusable at the carrier. Mm. You know, where the F3 had a really good HUD. I mean, it, it was uh, um, really nice. It had some neat features that we didn't have, like reverse thrust, you know, which yeah. allowed you to stop in a very short distance. Um, yeah, I, li I liked the jet a lot. Now, the wing sweep was a little, left a little lacking because the, um, the powers of E decided that they were going to leave it all in manual. Instead of because there is an automatic function on it that the Germans fly with. Um, so it was a little more challenging as far as wing sweep goes. But it was a great jet. It was. It was a lot of fun. Um, a great low level machine. It was, I think it performed a lot better at low level, which I think it was kind of originally designed for with the, you know, the uh, ground attack variant. You know, the, so. Yeah, with the, this uh, going on to the wing sweep here, like obviously it's manual, but I heard a lot of pilots say flew it. It's like, it, it it just takes you like you know a couple of flights and you're just like it's it's a gear stick is that is that correct in saying that almost well, and you just yeah, get used you, to it. You do get used to it for sure. 
Um, the only problem is if you haven't been flying a lot, it's something that you really have to get back in. Because, I mean, it's mm. if you don't move at the right time, obviously you'll bleed every bit of energy off and you're not getting it back. So it's it's something you have to be really on top of. And, yeah, you get used to it and you fly. I mean, fine, just it's like anything else. Um, but it is one more feature that if you're in combat, and really kind of mess you up if you, you know, if you aren't, if you weren't really current on it. So currency becomes a lot more factor. The more manual things you require in a jet, you know what I'm saying? I mean, especially in air combat, you'll find, you know, if you've gone away from flying, uh, um, you know, uh, for say a couple of weeks, you get back in, it takes you a couple of flights to really get back into your, your, your peak performance on air combat. It's something, it's a very perishable skill. And something like that is one of the things that falls out, you know, oh yeah, I'm go, you know, got to hit the wing sweep, got to hit the wing sweep. So... And because you've worked with a real, it must have been just natural working with a, a nav um, uh, in your time there. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was virtually the same. Did you, did you, I don't know if they said, I think it's the Brits that say, uh, if your wings are in the wrong position, they'll shout wings. Did they do that on the Tomcat or was that just the tornado? No, wait, that was something, yeah. I, no, I, and I don't think I ever had a guy shout it in the uh, tornado either. Ah, you yeah. know, I did try and stay on top of that, you know. But uh, <laughs> for sure, yeah, I mean, you could easily forget that. You know, you'd hope he'd let you know because very shortly you're going to die quickly in a dogfight if you don't have him out. So, <laughs> so what was the tornado cockpit like compared to the Tomcat? Uh, would you say they're quite similar in terms of layouts and you know systems? Very similar, very similar. I mean, it. Um, you know, I, I think about it. and I'm like, you know, obviously it's been a few years since I've been in the cockpit, but I mean, the in essence the same. I mean, really, you know, I'm I'm sorry, but you know, one jet to the next jet's. I mean, there's very little differences. The uh, it had, I mean, it was like you said. In a lot of ways, it was like a Tomcat, kind of a Tomcat light, a little smaller, you know. But a swing wing, dual you know, engine, Rio in the back, you know, air superiority fighter, you know, slash interceptor. It was, it was very similar. I mean, it, it, you know, and it made it very comfortable going to it. I'll, I'll just throw a little story in there. Um, yeah, well, we'd uh, the Air Force. You know what? Out of uh, um, building Hull Lake and Heath, they had uh, F-15Es. Now a lot of these guys were ex F-111 pilots, um, and they 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 needed to. But we wanted some, you know dissimilar dogfighting. So I I talked to them, and they said they only wanted to see you know two planes. And I said okay, and they were a little cocky. You know they're flying their new little F-15Es. I'm like okay. <laughs> so uh, I decided I'd only show them two. So we came out. And we met out in the. Uh, the uh, uh, the rain over the wash, you know, ATA out there. And, you know, and I said, well, here's the deal. What we'll do is we'll play fair as long as they're doing their job correctly. Now, the one thing the tornado had that was very superior to the Tomcat was its raw gear. That's the radar warning. So you could tell who was looking at you and you knew where they were. And very effective. Mm -hmm. So we came in and we came in, a, you know, in a flight of four. And I said, as soon as they light us up, meaning the, you know, their radar sees us, what we're doing is we're going to notch in just horizontal notch, which means they're going to, you know, then they'll, they'll have to split their radars. Okay. And we'll notch out. And if they drop one of us, I want that, that uh, a pair to split now to do a, a champagne, one to go high and one to go low. So we notch out and we start to go away. They drop us. We both notch. Now we have the turn. Once we're naked, meaning they weren't showing us on the rod here, we turn back in. So now there's four of us at varying altitudes about, 20,000 feet separating about five miles of being mm. uh, 10 miles of being somewhere, you know, in that region. And we come in and, and of course they, they weren't using their, their radars the way they were supposed to. And they really got torn apart. I mean, they, I don't think they saw any tornadoes in the end. So, uh, you know, except behind them when we got gun footage, um, you know, it's, uh, um, so yeah, maybe they learned a little humility there, you know, and that's where it comes yeah. down to, you know, um, who's in the, jet and how do you fly it you know what i'm saying um you're flying a tomcat and you you leave a, a cessna 172 alone that has a missile on it you're gonna get shot you know it's you know we came again you know fighting against mig 21s with unimproved atolls which is you know a piss poor plane with a really bad missile but you know something if you don't see them there you're you done yeah you know so when you used to go up and fight uh, in the F3 against, you know, the F-15s and whatever you, you else um, you went up against, would you be clean or would you have tanks on as well? Um, it all depended. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times we'd have tanks because you really needed the fuel, you know, um, and it did slow you down. You know, obviously every jet, when you put tanks on it, really degrades the performance. 
for the most part. Unless the bigger the jet and the more thrust of the weight, the less you notice it. Like in the F-14, really in the Bs, we didn't really gain much performance at all with our tanks off. Because mm -hmm. you had so much thrust to weight and you had a lifting body underneath the, the plane. You know, the body itself acts as a wing. So it really didn't, we just didn't see that much from the drag. Did you feel like you had to work a bit harder in the F3 to get the most from the jet? Yeah, it was well, definitely with the manual wings. It was not as user-friendly as the Tomcat, you know, in that aspect. Um, and besides, a little more thrust to weight, especially in the Bs, you can make up for a lot of things. You know, thrust to weight is, you know, speed is life, well, thrust is life. You know, it gets you there. So, no, definitely. Um, you know, and, you know, also I was working in a different system. We When we came there, they were transitioning – um, one of the uh, um, their their fighter weapons guys had gone over to the U.S. and they were incorporating, you know, basically they were going from a a rear tech scenario, kind of a World War II type scenario, to target aspect, which is really the modern, you know, uh, um, features of of air combat. You know how you intercept and do stuff like that. That's what the missile looks at, and you know he looks at the target aspect to see if it can get there instead of a displacement angles and stuff like that, you know, putting yourself a certain distance from the, the jet. So um, we were in a transition period right then. So, um, you know, in, in that aspect, you know, it was a, there was a little bit of uh, getting used to the different, you know, techniques they were, because we were still using, you know, the, the attack, re-attack, you know, with the, you know, figuring out displacement and, and distance from the aircraft. So uh, that was a little different, you know, because it was, I mean, that was a little, like I said, a little more World War II tactics, you know, attacking a big bomber squadron or something like that instead of a, a fighter. So can you talk us through uh, life on an RAF squadron coming from, you know, a U.S. Navy uh, Tomcat squadron? What was that like for you? Well, I mean, mind you now, I wasn't on a fleet squadron, you know, in, in the, the Royal Air Force. Yeah. But at the, the reg, we, we went out. I mean, there was something going on almost every night, it seemed like. Some type <laughs> of a formal thing. You know, obviously I had to get a, you know, talk to some stuff right away. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, I mean, we were out all the time. I mean, there was yeah. always something going on. And that was a lot of fun. You know, in the, of course, in my Navy squadrons, we were, you know, yeah, when yeah, we were yeah. at, you know, back at shore, you know, we went out, the guys went out, but didn't have as many formal things going on. There was mm -hmm. a tremendous amount. There was always something or a, a pub crawl or something. It was a lot of fun. A very, you know, social environment for sure. And was much uh, banter between you and the, uh, the F3 guys, you know, talking about the F14 and the F3, was there much like discussion there? Because I'm always interested in that, even like, even in a formal way or informal at the pub. Well, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I was kind of left because I'd always give them a hard time, you know, because I know I seem very meek and, and mild. And I'm sure most people think, I, no, okay, okay, I'm not. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah, I'm joking there. But uh, you know, you'd always take the piss out of them a little bit. You know, they'd be the the roller first truly believed that they had F fifteen E's, they'd rule the world. I mean, that was it. And you know, and I would always give them a hard time. I'd be I'd kind of come at them and like, you know, guys, you know, you gotta you gotta work to your strengths, okay? And they kind of look at you a little thing, I go, listen, think about the Beatles, the Who. I mean, you guys are musical people. You gotta work with it. You guys need to stick to music. I mean, really, music is your fun. <laughs> just joking with them because they were great pilots. I mean, you know, you're just having fun with them. Um, they were they were they were truly tremendous pilots and great people. You know, and, um, you know, and they, were they limited by their kit? Yeah, of course they were. You know, um, if they'd had F-15s, would they have been more effective? Yeah, they would have. They definitely would have. You know, I mean, the Tornado was a great jet, but I mean, let's be honest. Like the F-15 with the thrust weight, high altitude capabilities, big radars and stuff. I mean, it gives them a lot more capabilities. You know, and that's. Um, you know, they were great guys. I mean, just like the helmet. The helmet must have weighed, you know, 10 pounds. That huge helmet. You know, when you're fighting that thing, you're just like, wow, my neck is given. You know, you know, and we had the, the lighter stuff. I mean, kit makes a big difference. It does. But once again, just like us shooting up the F-15s, you know, in, in the tornado, it depends on who's in the pilot, you know, who's in the cockpit. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, because I think... You know, um... It's 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 probably did they ever get like protective because it's like it's like you're slating you're not slating but you're saying yeah if you had better kids so like well that's my baby don't <laughs> you don't don't talk about the F three like that they must have got oh, a bit no, defensive. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean no, the F three was a great. I mean, you could do what you needed to do. I mean, you know, um, fought a lot of people and did really well in the F three. 
you know, you can always make excuses for your, you know, blame the jet for your own yes. abilities or non-abilities. You know, you had some great abilities in the thing. You throw off the radar and you come in with your raw gear and they don't even know you're there. You have a real superior raw gear. Mm -hmm. And somebody doesn't see you, really easy to shoot them. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, it's you have to use tactics based around what your jet could do. Just like the Tomcat. We couldn't turn with an F-18. We couldn't get slow with an F-18. I mean, the, the jet was superior to ours in radius and rate. Yet we shot them a lot. Why? Because we used the, you know, the, the positive things in our jet that they didn't have. Just like in the tornado, you had things that they didn't have you could use. And, you know, that's uh, that's how you do it in all the times. I mean, I remember fighting an F-5. An F-5. I mean, no shit. A super old jet and getting the heck shot out of me. And you're like, what happened there? Well, it's his abilities. You yeah. know, it was a guy in the, in the, he knew what his plane could do. He fought his fight and not your fight. And, you know, that's what a dogfight, you have to. I mean, every jet has its positives and its negatives. Yes. You know, things that it can do well. And if you fight the other guy's fight, you're going to lose. If you came in with an F-16 and a Tomcat and you fought an energy fight with him, you're going to lose. Yes. All day long. Mm -hmm. I mean, because he could turn, his radius and rate were better than yours. He could turn faster around the circle and in a tighter circle. And you're like, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't fight his fight. So, you know, and it's like that in every jet. I mean, a MiG-21 has a tighter turn radius than we would in any of our modern jets. So if you fight his fight, you're going to lose to a MiG-21 mm -hmm. or a MiG-17 or a MiG-19. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, archaic jets. And, you know, so it's, it comes down to the, you know, know your tactics and know how to fight your plane. So you can make a lot of excuses, and we all could, you know, like, ah, oh, it, it was a win, I dust in my eye, you know, <laughs> or, you know, or you can learn how to fly your jet and use your, your benefits, you know, that it, it contains, because all of them have some. Of course, yeah. I have to ask you, what's the top speed you uh, hit in the F3? Because everyone knows it's quick down low, but what did you hit in the F3? I hit about 17518 was the max I could get out of it, you know, and that was high up, yeah. You know, we were doing the, you know, your your supersonic reattacks, you know, and stuff like that up there. Um, you know, it, uh, it's about I could get the max I could get out of the jet. You know, I, I uh, couldn't get Mach two, so. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I know, I, yeah. But of course, when I, when I hit Mach two in the Tomcat, I took all the paint off the tail when I came back too. It was oh, all you know painted up, really, and the stripper's like. What happened to all the paint? And you're like, well, I don't know. I mean, this bad paint job is all I can figure, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you've kind of mentioned it there, but uh, what would you dislike? What do you like and dislike about the F3 uh, the most from your time on the jet? Well, I love the raw gear. I mean, that was really superior. Um, you knew who was looking at you and when they were looking at you. I liked the HUD. It was great. I liked the reverse thrust. I thought it was fantastic. Um, the manual wing sweep was obviously the most detrimental part of it. I mean, it was. It was just kind of, it was a pain, mm -hmm. you know. The And you know the thing I liked even more? On the uh, Tornado, they have the refueling probe on the left side mm. by your throttles. Mm -hmm. The Tomcat and all the Navy jets are on the right. So you're looking cross cockpit when you're coming into it. Much easier to tank on the uh, Tornado. Much easier. And being in the Navy, we tanked a lot, you know, pretty much every flight. Very important. Mm -hmm. I really liked it on the left side. I know that seems something simple and you're like, not a big deal. But to us, it made life a lot better. No, it was a much better design. Much better. There you go. A few points score for my beloved F3 there, guys. Uh, there you go. They're, they're, this. Refueling, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they're the best thing. Yeah, the, but uh, yeah, Steamer, can you maybe share a, a couple of stories from your time on the F3 that stand out uh, for our viewers? Wow, I tell you what, uh, I remember one. We were, uh, um, I was working with, uh, my back seat huge, and we were going out over the North Sea. We were flying in support of one of the, uh, um, the fighter weapons school um, sorties, right? And they'd been waiting to get up for a long time because, you know, there is a little bit of fog in Lincolnshire. And, you know, they've been like a week, no wheels in the well. Well, they finally they briefed this, briefed this, briefed this, and we were going up as one of the adversary guides. Um, and we just launched off getting out there, and we are probably you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, you know, feet wet. And you look down and you can see the waves. It was sea state four or five, you know, so it was, it was rough. Winds were probably 45 knots down there. I mean, it was a, it was a rough day, you know, down in the, the North Sea. And oh, yeah. we're flying out and all of a sudden I kind of smelled something in the cockpit. And I asked my, my back seat, are huge? Do you smell anything? He goes, no, 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 mate, we're good to go. You know, and I'm like... <laughs> Something doesn't smell right, Huge. And he's like, uh, you know, and he's not saying anything. And I finally I just go, 
huge, I'm going back. Something's wrong. And he goes, we're doing what? And I'm like, because, you know, they've been trying to get this sortie out for, you know, weeks. And uh, so I'm like, you know, you're feeling like, oh, my gosh, you know, you hate to do that. I mean, we've got eight jets in the air and we have to be there. So I'm flying back and I have no lights. You know, now, you know, the, the tornado is a completely electric jet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, down the center, they have what's called the chimney mm -hmm. where they have a bundle of wires that run everything. It's all fly by wire, you know, everything in there. Well, I come back in. There's nothing, nothing. I call in and say, we're coming back early. They're like, Seymour, what's wrong? I'm like, something doesn't smell right. You know, and you're just, you know, I'm a foreigner, you know, and I'm like, yeah. oh, this is not going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this is, this is not satisfactory. Well, I land, I taxi in and my plane captain comes up to me and he walks up to the jet and he jumps back and I'm kind of like, but the whole side of the jet had turned brown. It turns out that there was a heat exchanger had, had come un, unhooked and was blowing 530, 35 Celsius degree oh. air through the uh, jet. Well, that whole, uh, we find out later that the whole, um, wire bundle down the center of the jet all the insulation had been burned off it, Ooh. every bit. The and it was blowing on the locks bottle, which sits right underneath the uh, the back seater, and it was brown. They said they pretty sure it would have given away in about two minutes from when we landed. And of course, you have you know liquid oxygen with a fire basically because it was you know burning back there. They said we'd have been a blowtorch. We'd have never made it back. Oh now, figure we were working about 200 miles off the coast in the North Sea. You know, they, they have the Lynx helicopters were our rescue helicopters, and they fly, what, 70 or 80 knots. So it would have taken them, you know, by the time they got off and got out there, we'd, it had been four hours at least with 45-knot winds out in the North Sea. You know, the, the temperature, water temperature out there was, you know, like 50. And we were in dry suits. They would have never found us. You know, it would have been it. It's a and good you call. Kind of go, oh, just by the grace of God, because seriously, a weird smell and you're going back in, I mean, just the jet was a total loss. Oh, was it really? Total loss, they said. Yeah. So it was just you come out of there and you're just like, wow. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, you're thinking you're, you're being a wimp. You're just like, wow, but just the good Lord DNL protect us there. Because I tell you what, we never got a single light indicating a fire or anything on the way back in. <laughs> you know, you just, yeah. That's amazing. Yes, there was meant to be here for something else, you know. Um, <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, but obviously, did you enjoy your time in the UK and on 56 Squadron on the F3? And did you take any of the tactics back or the ways of life we had over here from the squadron or life in general? Well, you know, kind of funny is uh, um, I did enjoy it very much. And I, I would, wouldn't have changed a, a thing about it. Um, you know, it had its challenges, you know, with different cultures and learning things and stuff. You know, it was... Uh, um, you know, I remember when we first got over there, you know, there's words in America that you use that are polite and nice that oh, mean yeah. other things <laughs> in England. And you go, you learn very quickly. I mean, it's a very different culture. Um, no, I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. And we brought a lot of things back. Now, mind you, as soon when I left there, I came back and I actually got out. So I really think I was a lot better fighter pilot, having worked in a different system with different people and stuff. I mean, and it's kind of, you felt kind of bad not bringing that back because I did. I learned a tremendous amount. You know, it reinforced some things I knew. It made me think about other things I did hadn't thought of, you know, in tactics and the way you handle stuff. Um, and I definitely was a better a better fighter pilot. Um, the things I brought back most, because then I went commercial and, you know, now I'm a captain at a, a major airline. Um, but the things I brought back a lot were some of the different designs and foods and stuff we had over there. Um, I remember we had a, uh, um, I can't even think what it's called, the, uh, but some of the desserts were just fabulous over there. My wife still makes them to this day. Um, oh, brilliant. You know, when I, I designed and built my own house, a couple of them, you know, and when I was over there, they had a separate area for the toilet. We didn't have that in the States. You'd have the bathroom, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I built those into my house. There was a lot of really neat things, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, the, uh, yeah, that, nice. you, you know, um, you can't gain to appreciate, you know, that uh, um, because it was just a different culture, you know, and, and we did integrate that. My oldest daughter was born over there, you know, so, uh, you know, she's always got a special, you know, England has a special place in her heart, obviously, um, <laughs> you know, but uh, um, we did. We enjoyed it tremendously. It was fun. We loved the people. Um, you know, it it really showed that in the end, you realize there was a lot more similarities than differences, you know, and, uh, um, you know, it uh, it just it changed the way you felt about, you know, England and, and the world in general, I think, a lot. 
Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff, Steamer. So I'm going to wrap up with a question from one of our patrons, and then just a couple of personal questions to get sure. more of an insight from you. So this is from Joe Kunzler. Uh, better interceptor and why? Tomcat or Tornado? Well, I mean, I I would have to say the Tomcat because of it's a bigger radar and bigger missiles. I mean, you know, the AUG-9, we could, we could look at a couple hundred miles. We could track 24 targets simultaneously, and we could shoot down eight at the same time in the Phoenix. You know, with about a, and I guess we can say now, you know, it's, it's gone 150 mile range, you know. So before the, you know, you'd even see us, we were shooting people, um, especially in the F 14D. You know, they'd be 65 degrees from being uh, uh, hot, and they'd already have the whole group broken out. They had an IRSTS. They go, okay, we got a gorilla, you know, which meant a, a large group of planes. Um, I'm, uh, Counting, okay, I'm, I got, I'm counting five, Fox 3, Fox 3, and you haven't even turned enough to even look at them yet, and they're already shooting. It's really phenomenal. Yeah, Steamer, do you have any hobbies? Oh, I, you know, I love fishing, um, hunting. As a matter of fact, I did a tremendous amount of bird hunting when I was in England. The uh, the farmers over there were just unbelievably gracious, you know, shooting pheasant over there. I, I got my first uh, chocolate lab over there, mm. fully trained hand signals. Um, from Mrs. Lambert up north, and just a fabulous. Matter of fact, I came and got another dog later. They were just, they were just superior. I mean, absolutely wonderful uh, chocolates up there, and uh, yeah, shot a tremendous amount of birds over there. You know, uh, um, I'd bring back, I'd feed the whole patch. You know, and they're like, ah, I got a few more pheasants. You know, so <laughs> it was uh, I had a ball. Um, I do a lot of fly fishing. You know, um, for trout, some uh, walleye. Go up for uh, um, muskie up north. You know, we, which are like a giant uh, um, northern pike. You know, the only monster, they're, you know, 50 inches in that region. So um, a lot of fun, you know, and trying to do that. I still have a hunting dog. Of course, now I have a French poodle, believe it or not. So uh, okay. a little That's more a another international. <laughs> <laughs> I see a theme here. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, I do that, of course. And then just, you know, I've got four children. So enjoying their life, you know. They're all kind of leaving the house now, you know, going into college and stuff. But, you know, sports and stuff like that, that's been kind of our life for the last, you know, uh, 20 years. So, Is there any aviation in your life apart from, obviously, your kind of day job, your airline job? Uh, do you still keep on, like, touch with people and keep up with the news on modern military aviation, anything like that? Well, I mean, you know, we have a lot of guys I fly with that are actually still in the military at, at my airline. So, you know, I hear that a lot. But truthfully, you know, I fly now. I mean, I'm flying you know, five, 600 hours a year, you know, with my job. So I don't do a lot of aviation outside of that. Just, you know, just at work. A busman's it's... holiday. <laughs> exactly. You know, exactly. <laughs> I know the answer to this one, but I'll have to ask you anyway, here, Steamer. Favorite aircraft you've flown? Wow. Um, obviously, I'd probably say the F-14B, but you know something? The Tornado has a very, very fond spot in my heart. I, uh, I love flying it. I love the people I flew with. Um, you know, it's uh, um, it's right up there. It really is. Hard to put them all, you know, they all have their own special times. But, you know, being overseas and enjoying the culture and the jet and stuff and being at the Royal Air it, uh, it's right up there with the Tomcat for me, too. Awesome the, um, stuff. Th cheers for humor me. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> no, it's I'm serious. So it was, you know, I mean, you know, there were some things that, you know, weren't as great on it, like the missile system. But, you know, so that it was a great jet to fly. I remember one of my last flights. Matter of fact, it was my last flight. I, I did the uh, the locks up through Scotland around, you know, low level down those. Nice. And, I mean, just absolutely beautiful. I remember I came over to a couple of little hills and there was somebody up there having a little hike, you know. And I'm probably 20 feet over the top of them. They're like, ah! it, mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, I mean, enjoyed the tar out of it. And it was just a different culture and the flying experience and stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I really wouldn't. Great stuff. One you would like to fly either past or present? Oh, I mean, um, well, you know, there was a chance to fly the Spitfire when we were there, you know, but they, they wrecked the uh, two-seater. So um, it didn't go up in that. Um, but probably, probably be the F-22, you know, which is a true air superiority, vector thrust, internal carriage. I mean, just wow. There, I don't think there's anything else like it in the world right now. And, and of course, we're getting rid of ours, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, they cut the dyes. You know, mm. the Obama administration cut the dyes, so we can't make any more. So kind of out of luck. I thought you might have said uh, Super Hornet. That would have been the dead. Uh, nah, it's, 
I mean, I was up in a Hornet and it was nice, you know, I mean, it's, it's a nice little jet, um, you know, but it's, it's kind of like a F-16, you know, F, F-18 there. I mean, it's got its own little capabilities and it's neat, but I mean, you know, I saw Top Gun too, you know, the, the new one. And I looked at it, my, when I came out, my family was all like, you know, dad, you know, would, do you miss it? And I'm like, you know, not even, I love doing it, but that's a young person's job. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It, uh, um, dog fighting and living on the car and people shooting at you and, you know, hair on fire. It was a great, it was a great when you're 25. Absolutely. You yeah. know, and now that I'm 35, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, you know, it's just not where I want to live. I mean, I love my life now. I enjoy the time at home. I love my family. You know, if I need some excitement, I'll go bird hunting, you know, go fishing. It's, I'm good. So, that sounds good. So what can we see for the future for Steam? Is there any big plans in the future? Or are you just happy with your, your lot right now? I tell you, you know, I was just telling somebody the other day in the jet, you know, I'm obviously not, you know, uh, that old. I mean, I'm, you know, um, but uh, truthfully, I'm happy where I'm at. It kind of felt like, you know, really the job I'm in right now is kind of a retirement job. And you know, after flying off the carrier and, you know, combat and stuff, you go, I'm really happy. I got a wonderful wife, great kids. You know, a nice home. We're like really happy. Life has been just joyous to us. You know, we got to see the world a lot. You know, uh, I took our kids. Uh, um, matter of fact, I took them uh, through England not long ago. We went to Coningsby, um, Mildenhall, Lake and Heath. Uh, went up through right. Scotland. Um, we flew over just just so they could see where we lived and whether you know my oldest daughter where she was from. And um, you know, we just. It really opened us up a lot to the world when we got over there because, you know, we traveled a lot through Europe and you saw artwork and stuff like that. And you realize, you know, I always kind of thought of myself as pretty talented. You know, you're like, ah, oh, you know, carrier pilot, you know. And, and mind you, we may be some of the best in the world at that. But then you see like Michelangelo and, you know, you know, the David and you're like, I saw Bane. Talents, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I mean, but talent that I couldn't even imagine. You know, you you go to the Louvre and, you, you know, you see the Mona Lisa and you're like, you, you, these pictures that are, they look like photographs and you you know it really opened you up to a lot of things and i think people when we travel around and we see other things it, it kind of makes you feel a lot smaller and maybe that's a good thing you know <laughs> to uh you know to really appreciate this world that we live in and you know kind of come together maybe a little bit more instead of you know part as we're seeing stuff like you know the war in russia and things like that where it just you see the idiocy you know it really made you appreciate everybody as a person a lot more i think yeah absolutely well, Steamer, it's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, I mean, it's been a, almost like a dream interview chatting about the Tomcat and the F3, <laughs> two of my favorite aircraft. Such a nice bloke. So yeah, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's, it's my pleasure to, you know, being, uh, have you on and chat about aviation and your career. Well, Mike, it was a pleasure talking to you too. I tell you, brought up a lot of really wonderful memories on the tornado. You know, the times over there, excitement and, uh, and fun, you know, very exciting going to a different culture. And I mean, I remember, you know, going around just, and it, it, it was uh, it was everything I was hoping it would be. It was really awesome. Like I said, I, I, I love the, the, the country and I, we wish you guys the best, you know, in everything. I'm gonna let you go and enjoy your day with your family. Thanks again, Mike, and cheers to you as well. Cheers.